the thing about giving up alcohol, it's not that it's going to solve all your problems. It's no. not, it's not like giving up alcohol. That's that, and that's where some people get uh, misunderstood and they think, oh, I've given alcohol, everything will get better. No, 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 not true. However, what it does for you is it finally takes away that crutch that you probably were using to ha- to handle all your problems, to 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 just stay on the surface level of your problems to truly begin to face your problems. So I tell yep. people when you stop drinking, it doesn't solve all your problems, but it finally gives you the emotional fortitude and the ability to begin to solve your problems. Hey y'all, hey y'all, what's going on? Welcome back to the Stacking Days podcast where we highlight underrepresented journeys of sobriety from within the BIPOC community. I'm super excited today. Uh, we have a, a brother that I've been in communication with and chatting with, you know, offline, well, online, but offline uh, for some time now. Uh, and uh, really looking forward to getting into our chat, considering the time of the year that we're recording this is, is in, in January, where a lot of folks are thinking about, you know, what does the new me look like in the new year? Uh, I think Kenneth, who's joining us today, is going to have some real perspective on that. Uh, and then in addition to that, I'm also just really excited about, you know, Ken's story. Uh, you know, he has had his own uh, journey with with alcohol and, you know, in him, you know, kind of cutting alcohol out of his life and, you know, performing that that gesture of um, of of self betterment. Uh, he's found sobriety in that. Right. And I think that he's gotten a lot of lessons in there that obviously or maybe not obvious to you yet, but it will be. Uh, that he's passed on to the the community at large. Um, So, you know, Kenneth is an entrepreneur. He's a corporate leader. He's an all around good guy. And, you know, in a space that that, you know, also kind of lacks racial representation, that is authorship. um, You know, Ken has also written his own book, Bamboozled, which is a literary testament uh, to why alcohol really makes a fool of all of us. Uh, You know, so without further ado, Let's in, uh, invite, uh, you know, Ken McKimsey into the room uh, to have a conversation around living alcohol-free. Ken, welcome to Stack of Days. All right. Thanks so much, man. I definitely appreciate it. When we first talked, I want to say it was like maybe four or five months ago. I, and I, I don't remember how we got connected, maybe through LinkedIn or someone connected us. But I yeah. definitely knew I was excited to talk on your podcast because you're right. It is a uh, it's a different slant on there's a sobriety movement and then there's uh, the BIPOC community, community yep. as well. and. And I think there's there's two separate things, but then there is a, a connection between the two that creates a different slant in and of itself. So excited to talk about that today and hopefully provide some value to your listeners. Thanks, brother. Well, let's get right into it, man. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your relationship with alcohol or the lack thereof and how you got to that space of doing away with the substance. I know that it was somewhat unintentional in you being a long-term um, you know, person in sobriety, but why don't you give us a sense of where that relationship with alcohol started and when you started to reevaluate that relationship that subsequently led uh, to your own sobriety? Yeah, yeah. So, Ray, my relationship with alcohol began very similar to most people, right? I I really think there was nothing special about how it started and very quintessential in some ways to the story that a lot of people have. I grew up, uh, and I tell people because I I don't think this affected it, but in reality, this was a part of it without a father, right? A lot of times that does happen, unfortunately, in the African-American community, way less now than it used to. That's one of the things I think we don't talk about is how good um, – African-American fathers are actually doing. But at any rate, I didn't have one growing up. So for that reason, some of the things I didn't learn how to do, talk to the uh, talk to females, be the coolest guy in the room. There's a lot of lessons that I didn't have a father there to teach me. So when I got to college and being somewhat 18 year old um, around a new group of people. And at the time, you know how it is. You think that there's something wrong with you because you have anxiety around other people as opposed to you're 18 years old, just leaving your house around people you don't know. Everybody's going to have that. But for me, I had this sense of lack of confidence because I never had a dad and never had a dad to teach me these things. And I wanted to figure out how do you become confident around people? How do you get a little more courage to go talk to the opposite sex? So one of my friends, as you mostly happened, I didn't drink my freshman year, but my sophomore year, he said, hey, man, get a beer. 
relax. I promise you it will make things a lot easier for you. And I was like, you know what? Let me try this alcohol thing. Didn't drink in high school at all. As I said, I didn't drink my first year in college. So I started drinking. I said, all right, let me try this beer. Got a, a, a probably two beers in and all of a sudden the buzz hit and it was like I was the life of the party. So yeah. I went being from Ken Middleton. I was never shy. I won't say that. I wasn't shy. I wasn't introverted. But I never was the person that I thought I was. I, I thought I could be. I was never the life of the party. I wasn't in the, the most confident guy in the room. So once I started drinking, I became that person. I became everybody that I thought I was. And I was thinking, man, this is the best thing ever created. Like this is exactly as advertised. And so I leaned into that. So I was the person that life of the party would always drink, would always do crazy things. Just that was it. So this happened all the way through college, pleasure fraternity, lived that lifestyle. As you can imagine how that ratcheted up my drinking, yeah. graduated. And then I went into sales and I tell people all the time. And I, I've said this on numerous podcasts. If you think college is your undergrad in drinking sales is your masters because that is when you really start drinking more so than ever before it's around it's part of your job you're schmoozing your client it's so important and even the relationships with your coworkers is so expected that if you don't do it it actually kind of hurts you a little bit in some respects so that even increased my chance my drinking relationship and now here's where it got here's where things were somewhat challenging so for me as I was drinking, my life was fine. There was no rock bottom. I wasn't having issues. Actually, I was excelling at my job while I was drinking. And as I looked at some of my mentors and my bosses or my boss's boss, they were drinking as much or more than I was. So in my mind, I'm thinking there's nothing wrong if they're doing it. And look, they're making X amount of money. They're living in these big houses and nice neighborhoods. That's what I aspire to. Why would I stop in any capacity, because clearly they don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. Life is fine. Where things changed was in 2017 when I made the decision to leave my company. I was 37 years old at the time, and I told myself I wanted to pursue entrepreneurship. I've always had a bug ever since I can't remember. And I always said to myself, I want to say I at least tried and failed than to say I didn't try at all. And I thought at that point, I was 20, 36 at the time, excuse me. I said, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm in a good position to do it. Why don't I try it? So I decided to leave my company and went on the journey to entrepreneurship. So anyone that's done it, anyone that's experienced it, know it is so hard to be an entrepreneurship yeah. entrepreneur because you're everything. You're, you're the accountant, you're the HR, you're marketing. Like you, I was working, right, I was working 70, 80 hours a week and yeah. just not getting anywhere. The first year by myself, I think I made less than $40,000 as an entrepreneur. Like it was ugly. It was, That's it a was lot of not, pressure. <laughs> dude, it wasn't getting it done, my man. And you're, you're go, I was going from making a six figure salary, multiple six figure salary to making 40 K with the lifestyle I was used to living. Like it was right. a problem. So I was then dating my, my girlfriend at the time. Now my wife, and I said, all right, babe, it's been a year and some change. I might have to go back to corporate America. But before I go back to corporate America, I want to unequivocally be able to look in the mirror and say, I gave it a thousand percent. And I always knew, not that I ever thought alcohol was a problem for me, but anyone that doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't admit that the day after they're drinking, that they're not giving a hundred percent, they're not at the top of their game. They're lying. I knew that the day after drinking and as I was aging, it was becoming much more pronounced every time. Right? Before when I was 22, I snapped back real quick the next day. When I was 36, nah, that's <laughs> not a bad. Little longer. <laughs> oh my goodness. I right, listen, it might not, I might not be ready to do anything till noon. So I yeah. said, listen, I need to cut out alcohol. And to your point, the goal was never to stop drinking forever. That was never the goal. The goal was 90 days. I was going to stop drinking for 90 days. And at the end of the 90 days, let's reevaluate and see what happens. So I stopped drinking and I tell people it's, it was amazing. Over those next 90 days, Ray, as I shared before, first year only made $40,000. Over those next 90 days, I made more money over those 90, those three months than I had made in the previous total nine months. And not just a little bit more, not just a smidgen more. I'm talking about multiples times exponential times more and i looked at my wife and i was like listen because she luckily married the best person in the world she did it with me right it, i wasn't by myself That's she awesome. said she said babe if you want to do it i'll do it with you let's do it together i'm like 
appreciate you. And we did it together. And I was like, hey, and it was kind of funny because I, the two years, as I said, I wasn't ever my intention to not drink again. But after that 90 days, I was like, I think there's something to it. I was like, let me do another 90 days and see what happened. And then after six months, I was like, let me do a year. And then after mm-hmm. a year, I was like, there's no way I'm ever going back to drinking. And then that was where it got me where to where I am now and just changed everything for me in regards to my relationship. Man, I love that, man. Thank you for 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 sharing that story. I feel like, you know, I, I ta- I've, I've had the great good fortune of talking to a lot of folks, you know, by way of stacking days. And there really is a spectrum on which people kind of sit when it comes to how much they are either dependent on alcohol, whether physically, socially, um, you know, and, and, you know, it, it really runs the gamut, but there is always that moment that, you know, folks get to, um, and sometimes it, it leads to sobriety. And as we know, sometimes it doesn't, that moment that they get to where they say, okay, I have to take a really hard look at my relationship here and maybe do things a little bit differently. Um, so I would love to know in that moment where you had this nagging suspicion that, in, in, you know, in, in kind of running this audit across your life and your business, that alcohol was the one thing that you yeah. needed to address acutely. What was it that spoke so loudly to you that that was the piece that you needed to remove from your life at the time, even if it was only going to be for 90 days? Ray, that's a great, great question. And I think for me, it was because of how pervasive it was in everything I did in my life. Yep. I thought about everything. The, the, here, was, here was the reality. I've always been a hard driver, always been like ever since I was 14 years old, wake up at five o'clock in the morning run five miles in the morning. I've always been the guy that wants to work harder than everyone else. So that's always been my MO. That was who I was. Whenever I saw myself not living up to who that person was, it always involved alcohol. I knew it did. When I ever slept in past seven o'clock in the morning, it was because I was out the night before. Whenever I did something that was questionable and I looked back and I was a little ashamed of the activity that I did, it was because of drinking. It was, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was one moment, Ray, but it was a compounding effect of, of, of recognizing. And I think in the, if you want to look at the moment, it was me saying, all right, if I don't want to go back to corporate America without saying that I've given it my all, what could be that thing? And then all of a sudden me playing back the tape of all of these previous episodes that I have the evidence. And now it's kind of culminated to this is a decision I think I need to make for myself because this thing has not truly helped me. And I think there's a chance that if I give it up, everything I will ever wanted, I could find on the other side of it. So it wasn't one moment. It was almost a series of moments over time, finally culminating to one spot. Yeah, that makes total sense. I, I, I think that you probably also in retrospect, appreciate that you were open enough to listen to those messages uh, that you were trying to send yourself and gave yourself an opportunity to find some clarity so that you could make a longer term decision as to, you know, is this something that I want to be part of my life or not? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was feel, I almost feel like it was, uh, it, it was, I was lucky, man. I was fortunate, right? I think, you know, because I left my company and I think, you know, at the time I, end, I actually ended up going back to my company is another story, but I decided to go back to my company for other reasons. And I always question like, Hey, should I have left my company? But the reality was, had I never left my company, I probably would still be drinking today because mm. of the environment that I was in was so built around alcohol because yep. of the the people that I were working with were so accepting of it. I was not around people in any way that was showing me anything other than this. And yeah. so when I, when you're in an environment in which you are not given a chance to think other than what other people are doing, the normalcy way of what people are doing, you it's it's challenging to uh, to not think that way. So I almost think I was lucky, man, of making that decision and being in a situation in which I didn't have someone pulling on me for me not to hear the lesson that the universe was telling me. Yeah, I think that that the the professional environment for those who who live you know, kind of more conventional professional lives where that happens to be the case for them when they're, I I was also in sales and 
sales that was basically dovetailed off the hospitality industry, which is also mm. very oh much, God. very you know, much, yes. very much about about uh, the consumption of alcohol. I'm I, I'm curious, and we don't have to go too deep into this about uh, about your reentry into the corporate world, but as a black man. As a person of color, there's this underlying notion that we have to work twice as hard as the next guy in order to, uh, you know, in order to achieve the same degree of success. So in the same like vein of keeping up with the Joneses, did you feel as though that you had to drink twice as hard to kind of play that game with folks, considering that it was so much a part of the culture that you almost had to put that cloak on and really act the part when you did? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I, I didn't feel like I had that. I definitely feel like I had to work twice as hard. There was no doubt about that, but not drink twice as hard. But I did feel a pressure to drink. There's no doubt about it. The option to not drink was not really there. Not in the sense that if I didn't drink, somebody is going to be like, what are you doing? You're an idiot. But when you see everybody going, leaving the office to go to a happy hour and, and this is the social event that everyone's doing and there's no alternatives. Then you learn that for you to build relationships with your coworkers, you definitely need to do that. Now, to the point of when I came back to the company I was working with, what was the change and how did that affect the difference of my level of success? I was fortunate, Ray, in the sense that I had matured in my sales ability and in my natural maturity as a man that I understood there were things, other ways that I could build relationships with people. I got to think as a 22 year old, a 26 year old, when I started with the company, it, it probably would have been a lot more difficult for me to say no to the happy hours or for me to go to the happy hours, just not drink, like felt like I was fine. Um, so I will say if you th it, thinking about corporate America in general, I do think African-American or not African-American, there is an undue pressure on newer people to partake in alcohol, to be part of the crew. And I think it's something we need to talk about because um, it's not fair to people who don't really drink because what happens to those people is that I personally think sometimes they lose out on opportunity because they're not like the Billies and the Susans that might like to drink and therefore the bosses that do that likes them. But and the second thing, it sometimes be is the beginning of their dependency on alcohol. And yeah. that's part of what creates it for them. My wife used to work at the same company I did. And she said she didn't really drink that much until she started working for my company. And then when she started working for my company, her drinking escalated tremendously. And then when she left the company, guess what? That drinking level didn't go back down. She kept drinking. Yeah. And so it's something that just we just need to be cognizant of. And I think more people need to talk about it because you know, it's just not fair to people long term to make them feel like they have to do that. No, totally. I mean, to your point, n n not only do we need to talk about it and just kind of address what has been the norm, I feel like, you know, as, you know, folks have gone into this, you know, for some folks are in almost a hybrid environment where they spend, you know, time at home, but then they also spend, you know, a, a shorter, you know, fraction of time actually socializing with their coworkers in the office or out of the office. That almost like increases the likelihood that they're going to be in an environment where they're going to be drinking, right? Because there's fewer right. oper there's fewer moments when they're in those communal spaces with their coworkers and they're taking that back into their home. Right. So similar to, to you know, to the, what you're saying about your wife, where, you know, her 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 level of consumption didn't drop after she left the company. What happens to those folks who are moving back in and out of that space where they're, you know, with the coworkers, but then, you know, working with those same coworkers from home? I think that there, there is a really interesting conversation to be had around like the future of work and yeah. what alcohol looks like because of this very unconventional model that we, you know, a lot of us have been kind of thrust into over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I, without a doubt, everything COVID changed everything. Right. Yeah. And for some people, it it increased their dependency on alcohol for other people like myself. It made it easier for me not to drink. Um, 
But yeah, I definitely think if as I I think where we are, Ray, as it relates to alcohol, is almost like where we were with smoking about 40, 50 years ago, right? Yep. You watch all these movies back in the day with people smoking on planes, they're yeah. smoking it, they smoke it everywhere, they smoke yeah. everywhere. It, it was just so accepted and how dangerous it is. I think we're in the place in which people are gonna start looking at alcohol the way people look at cigarettes now, in the sense that if you want to do it, you can do it. But and this is the whole point of my book, right? This is the whole point of where I got but created any enough alcohol is not your friend. You just need to be aware of the trade-offs you're making for it. Like, and I don't think when and this is why my this is why I started Alcohol is Not Your Friend, the publication. And this is why I eventually wrote the book. When I was in college, Ray, and I talked about the sense of, all right, I'm, I'm going to start drinking because it makes me talk to females better. It makes me easier to dance, all of that good stuff. I was just thinking about the positive effect of it. And in my mind, as long as I don't end up like the, an alcoholic on the corner, which, you know, that's going to take 20 years of drinking, hardcore drinking for me to become that person. I'm OK. That was in my mind. I in no way had a sense of all the cognitive ways that I was being hindered, all the physical ways I was being hindered, the physiological way it was creating the dependence for it, right? Yep. In myself, how it was increasing my anxiety over time and my and, and decreasing my ability to have the emotional fortitude to deal with issues without it. That is what I want to do. I want to educate people on, hey, you can drink if you want to, but I just want to make sure you're aware that there are all of these ways that you do not ever have to be an alcoholic, that your life is going to be negatively, negatively impacted if you do so. Well, I, that's a great segue. Let's 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 get right into the into the book then, uh, yeah. Bamboozled and, and the work you're doing right now. I I'd love to know how you go from someone how you go from someone who is casually, you know, who is sober curious. Right. Right and decides to you know give you know sobriety a shot to someone who goes to such a deep level of curiosity that you're pulling out all of these science you know founded uh facts and data points that clearly lay out a case for alcohol being a corrosive poison to someone's life in so many different ways whether it be professional emotional development whether it be relationships so on and so forth so walk me through what that part of the journey looked like for you and then we'll get into some of those like high level findings that i think that any lay man or woman can take a look at and say oh this is probably something that i should consider if i'm now sitting in a place where i am evaluating my own relationship with alcohol Absolutely. Absolutely. So as I share with you, I would, the original plan was 90 days, 90 days. I was like, all right, I'm not going to drink that. And we'll see what happens at the end of 90 days. Now, mind you, and it's funny because I just kind of thought about this and, and, and did a video about this because I, I kind of reminded myself of this situation. This was not the first time that I had taken a break, a long-term break from drinking. I had had two previous stints of not drinking for 90 days. I had done the 90 day thing before. The difference in this time, Ray, that made all the difference is that I said this time I'm going to be more intentional to see how much because I knew mentally it was making it harder for me to think in the morning. Like that's just natural. Like when you wake yep. up over a hangover and you sit at your computer and you're trying to get things done for you to type that email, it's going to take you a little bit longer than it would take for you otherwise. Yep. So for me, it wasn't about just not drinking for 90 days. It was about. I don't want to drink for 90 days and mentally I want to see how much sharper I can be and how much I could push myself to achieve in those 90 days. So I was so much more intentional. Now, part of that, I said, oh, well, let me read some literature on, you know, not drinking and kind of what it does for you. So I just happened to stumble upon uh, Nancy Grace's Disnaked Mind. And this was two weeks into my alcohol consciousness. That's the term I use, alcohol consciousness instead of okay. sobriety. Just I use I, I say alcohol consciousness because sometimes when you say sobriety, like, hey, how long you been sober? The first thing you get is, oh, man, I didn't know you had a problem. Like, right. They they want to be like, yeah, I didn't. Like, what was what was your rock bottom? What happened? Were you trying to sell your children? Like like they want to hit like it like. So it, it has for some people. And it's part of like my focus is that it's not about how bad things were is about how good things could be without it right mm. so i like to use the term alcohol consciousness because it's around it's not about you not drinking because you you might have a problem with it it's about you knowing 
what alcohol can do to you squarely. You have it right. in your mind and you making that decision because you want to be healthier. Yep. So at any rate, so I'm, I'm reading this book, Nancy Grew, two weeks later, two weeks into me not drinking, we take a flight overseas. We have a seven hour flight and I'm like, all right, I got time to kill. Let me read this book. So I read that book, Ray. And like I said, prior to reading that book, the thought was 90 days. But as I read the book, Nancy does a great, um, or a, a great, um, Annie Grace, Annie does a great ability of giving scientific information as well about yep. what alcohol does to you, how it affects you physiologically, mentally, cognitively, all of those things. And I just, I didn't know any of that. None. Like it was, it just blew my mind. And I'm thinking all of these years that I was drinking, and I didn't know I was doing this to my gray matter and, and, and affecting my ability for my synapses to click and for me to think and potentially long-term memory as I age. And had I known that, I don't, I don't know if I would I have drank. Of course I would have drank some, but would I have drank as long as I did or as much as I did? Definitely not. Yeah. And so from that, it, it began this voracious desire to learn as much as possible. And I just started reading all these books. Uh, Craig Beck's Alcohol Lied to Me, William Porter, Alcohol Explained. I was just just crushing Quitlid and trying to understand it. And during in the midst of doing that, I just felt like there was a little bit of a disconnect in between some of the authors in the book and who I felt like I was because a lot of them – you know, they had a relationship in which, you know, they were they were doing things or putting their family in jeopardy or not remembering. There was a lot of like not quite terrible rock bottom versions, but issues that were very bad for them that said this is why they had to give up alcohol. For me, I never felt like I had to give up alcohol. I felt like it was the decision that I made because there was a much better version of myself inside of me that I didn't feel like I was living up to yet. Mm -hmm. And so I then said, I want to start a publication, Alcohol is Not Your Friend, ANA, on Medium. And the focus was to scientifically educate people on the way alcohol affects you. It's not to tell you not to drink. At the end of the day, the same thing with Bamboozle. The goal of ANA, the goal of Bamboozle, the goal of any of my writing, it is not to tell people not to drink. The goal of my writing is to educate you on what alcohol does. And then with that information, you make the decision of what you want to do. So I got so I just started writing enough. I got so excited about the publication. We got a bunch of other writers in it. And I was like, I really wanted people to be educated. And we just try to give people different strategies to quit because everyone has their own way of doing it. I quit cold turkey. On a Friday, I said, babe, or Saturday, I said, babe, I don't think I'm going to drink anymore. Sunday, I, I didn't drink a drop again. That was it. That was the decision I made. For other people, they may need more help than that. So the purpose was to educate a lot of people. Now, as that, that was uh, May of 2020 is when I started ANA. And as you can imagine, the ball just, just kept rolling. And I said, you know what? I don't think there's a book that really talks about here, giving up alcohol, not because things are bad, but because of the life you can live. I want to write that book. I want to write a book that speaks to all different people, all different places. And honestly, the very first part of that book, and it's very similar to um, in the sense that when we talk about um, the, it, my message is different because it says at the very, I think the very first line is this book is not for alcoholics. Very yep. first line. And the yep. reason I say that is because I was never in that place. I, I could in no way try to act like I know what it's like to be in that person's shoes. And until I'm in someone's shoes, I don't feel like I'm qualified in any way to try to give you advice. But for me, if you're sober curious, if you think there's a better version inside of you, if you just want to understand what are you giving up every time you decide to drink alcohol, I can give you that all day and every day. And that's why I wrote the book, because it was just around giving people the information, making sure they're aware. And for me, where I'm really focusing now, honestly, where I want to spend more time and hopefully this will gain attraction, and I believe it will, I want to talk to the, the college students. Mm -hmm. And not in the sense of don't drink in college. I don't believe that. Funny enough, people will be like, and I, I wrote an article about it. I don't think you should. I think there is a certain point in your life that it is fine to drink if you want to. But there's a certain point you should stop 
And I think everyone should just know or be educated on what alcohol is doing to you, especially at a younger age. And then you drink making that decision, understanding that. And that is my focus, bamboozle, is to get that information out there, hopefully to educate the college community, is educate everybody. But I really want to focus on the college community because if someone had given me this book when I was 21, 22 years old, I would have kept drinking but I definitely would have stopped so much earlier and my relationship would have been so much different than what it looked like over the um, continual 19 years that I did drink. No, that makes total sense. Uh, You know, when I, when I, I appreciate that, 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 that context and, and also the, the, the one line that you open the book with to make the distinction that this book isn't for alcoholics, so to speak, I will say, however, that like knowledge obviously is power. So even if you happen to have a, a, a true dependency on on alcohol, and as you're kind of you know, there's a lot of quit lit out there, right? And as right. you're kind of grasping for data points that serve you know your education around alcohol, uh, I do think that there's a lot of value that that, yeah. that you can find um, in bamboozled. Uh, there's a lot of kind of real world examples as to, you know, how alcohol can show up in your life. And I think that also, you know, alcohol is a, is a, 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 alcoholism and the consumption of alcohol is a journey, right? And in reading some of the stories that you had included in the book, I could kind of go back in my life and recognize a point in time where my relationship with alcohol resembled that of, you know, one of the characters that you yeah. were kind of, you know, that you were highlighting at, you know, on a company retreat or, you know, or, you know, someone in sales, you know, versus a colleague who, you know, maybe wasn't on the same track as them. So I, I thought it was a really great read. And, and also, you know, in a space where, and I mentioned this in the opening, where there just really isn't a lot of representation from an author standpoint right, when it right. comes to who's writing into this space, I think it's a valuable read from that perspective as well. So yeah. don't sell don't sell your your uh, you know your, <laughs> your 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 reach short. Um, but as far as like the the college student is concerned, I mean, there's a lot of talk, a lot of data that is out there saying that the younger generations are drinking less without yeah. even really being um, persuaded to drink less. Like, what's your perspective on being able to reach that 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 audience to give them, you know, more education to support something that they might already be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, I, I just want to make sure that people understand that. Um, the age of 18 to 25 is your most or, or your strongest, most impactful cognitive years. And if you do any drug, alcohol, cocaine, PCP, anything heavily, you greatly reduce the effectiveness you can have during that time to for you to develop mentally. And I just yeah. want the kids to know that. And because I, I have heard that they're drinking less, but they're doing shrooms more. I don't think that's good either, right? Like, you can't, right? So (laughs) I I just want to make sure people are aware of that age of 18 to 25, when your body is growing, when your mind is growing, it's growing faster. That's why you can learn such amazing stuff. Think about calculus, sine and cosine. I couldn't tell you what that is now. Back in the day, you used to be able to have no problem, right? Um, So like, so like, I just want them to know, like, that is a, those seven years are such a precious time in your life. If you want to drink some, that's okay. Just don't overdo it. Because if you overdo it during those seven years, you might not ever be able to get it back later, right? So I just really want to make sure the kids are thinking that way, they understand that, and they're making decisions with that squarely in mind. Um, no. But I, I think it's good that less kids are drinking 100%. I wish somebody would have told me that when I was in school. Yeah, if there are, are any kids listening to this podcast and you are considering you know, your relationship with alcohol and drinking less, don't substitute that with mushrooms. No. I, take it from a couple of guys who are, who got, you know, some more years on you. It's, it's not, it's not going to do you any good. No, not it's not going to do you any good. No. Uh, all right. So we are, you know, at the time of this recording, we're, we're the first week of January, 2024. A lot of folks, I think just naturally 
are looking at what uh, a new version of themselves could be in a new year. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about how you look at a 90 day kind of pause or a 30 day pause, whether it be dry January or something a little bit longer that may have some more stickiness to it. What would be kind of like your roadmap for someone who's looking for structure around how they could pursue something similar to that, what you've done? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, as I shared, I, for me, I stopped drinking two times prior and no change. Nothing stuck. I went right by the drinking and I didn't really experience the positive impact that I could have. So I tell people, if you're going to do a dry January, if you so do, first of all, I think it needs to be longer than that. I think dry January is cool, but it's a little bit of a fad. 30 days isn't that long. And then honestly, when you think about the compounding effects of alcohol, 30 days, you're not really going to feel it. Now, 30 days is better than nothing. So don't, don't, don't mishear me. If you're going to do that, I'm not saying don't do anything. If you're going to do 30 days, if that's your beginning, right? To Ray's point earlier, everyone has their different journey. If 30 days is the beginning journey for you, go for it, my man or my woman. However, if you can do 90 days, I would highly suggest to try to extend it because that's when you'll really start experiencing the true compounding effects. Now, there's something I just came out with and it's related to when I quit drinking. It's called the Dry 90 Challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's the exact same thing that I did. I didn't do on purpose, but it, it was the thing that helped change everything for me. And the Dry 90 Challenge, uh, Ray, is around, you, there's three things that you got to do during those 90 days. If you just abstain from drinking for 90 days and don't do anything, you won't give yourself the opportunity to experience the true effect that you can have. So, mm. but if you do these three things in conjunction with not drinking, you will then at the end of the 90 days, you can decide what you want to do. But I guarantee you will see the positive effects that it can have and the difference in your mental sh shift. Number one is exercise for 30 minutes. It's just so important. Exercise is just so important in general, right? But when you think about drinking, and you think about the artificial creation of dopamine that so many of us are used to based on alcohol and how it spikes that the endorphin spike inside of us. When you stop drinking, your body is going to be missing that. One of the very few ways that you can replace that is naturally replace it is through exercise. So I tell people you need to exercise for at least 30 minutes every day. During the 90 days, if you can, well, 30 minutes at a time, and we'll talk about the, the frame and the flex of it in a little bit, but 30 minutes because it does two things. One, it'll reduce your cravings. It'll help with the reduction of the cravings so you won't want to drink as much. And then two, you're going to need to find other things to do with your time. If your yeah. body is used to drinking every day at five o'clock, guess what? The five o'clock when you're not drinking, you're going to start feeling those cravings. And if you put yourself in a position of going home and doing nothing, you might find yourself lo longing for that beer. But if you're at the gym and you're working out and you're getting a good pump in, the chances of you wanting to get that beer probably isn't that great, right? So it's going to help on those two fronts. So exercise for 30 minutes. Two, what we talked about earlier, read, quit, lit. So one of those books, Bamboozle, How Alcohol Makes Fruits of Us All, would be a great book to read. Any Grace's This Naked Mind, all the good books. There's so many out there read a quit lit book for 30 minutes a day. Like just, you want to educate yourself on what alcohol is doing to you because mentally you need to understand what the effects of alcohol are on you. So now that you're not drinking, you can compare how are you feeling now versus how you were feeling before and then get a feel for is this, are you experiencing the positive side of it? So educating yourself and doing a comparison analysis of who you are now versus who you are when you're drinking to see how you feel. And the third thing, and I really believe in this, you should pick some type of hobby, something mm -hmm. that you always wanted to do, whether it could be playing a musical interest, instrument, it could be learning a new language, it could just, whatever it is that could, that's going to stimulate your mind. I tell people, be aggressive. Choose something that you don't think you could ever do if you were drinking because you know you either wouldn't have the consistency to stick with it or you wouldn't have the mental ability to focus on it. Choose a hobby that you want to do for 30 days. Now, here's the caveat. You don't have to do all do that for 30 minutes. But the caveat is you don't have to do all three of those for 30 minutes every day. You just need to do two of the three 
every day for 90 days. So that gives you the flexibility to mix and match based on your schedule to then make it realistic. Because honestly, working out every day for 90 days, 30 minutes, that I don't think everybody's going to do that, come close to doing that, right? Yeah, but you'd be, I, I mean, you would be ripped after 90 oh days. Oh my God, you would be amazing. <laughs> It'd be the, the, the flex 90 challenge. Yeah. But, um, but with a combination of reading for 30 minutes, exercising for 30 minutes and yet walking does count walking for I'm, i will count that as exercise and or doing a hobby for 30 minutes two of those three every day for 90 days then you will see the growth and then at the end of those 90 days you assess if you don't see enough of a change to be like all right something is here then go back to drinking no harm no foul who can't like listen you tried it you now you know you're gucci if you want to go back to drinking it because you think your life is better before it but i say at least just like i didn't want to go back to corporate america until i could say that i've given it everything at least you will know that you gave it a shot and you know where things stand but i feel fairly confident if you do it you're going to experience enough of a change that you're going to be like okay maybe I need to do this 90 more days to see, cause it, it only gets better with time. And so. to no, totally. I mean, I, I, I love that the, the read the quit lit part I think is really important just because that kind of just really keeps things on the front of mind, right? Yep. When you're kind of checking in on what you are moving forward with intentionally through reading, I think really keeps you, uh, you know, in in the the headspace to continue with, you know, if it's a challenge, I, I think that that's a good call out. Um, I am curious because a lot of the folks that I talk to on this show, you know, maybe they started, you know, with a challenge of thirty days, ninety days, and then ultimately, like yourself, realize that you know sobriety is the way, or even alcohol conscious is the way that they want to continue to live their life moving forward. I think that the longer that you remove alcohol from your life, the more space it gives you to do kind of all of that internal work, which yeah. I think is where the, the true value of removing alcohol from your life is. And the reason why I say that is, what are some of the benefits that one might come to in that shorter window of time of 90 days that would be refreshing from a mental health perspective uh, yeah. that, that, that might enable them to make a decision that, hey, this is something that I probably want to give it a little bit more time because I'm starting to see signs of things that, uh, that I like that are making me feel the way that I always had wanted to feel. Yeah, yeah. I tell people all the time, um, Ray, the thing about giving up alcohol, it's not that it's going to solve all your problems. It's no. not, it's not like giving up alcohol. That's that, and that's where some people get uh, misunderstood and they think, oh, I've given alcohol, everything will get better. No, 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 not true. However, what it does for you is it finally takes away that crutch that you probably were using to to handle all your problems to 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 just stay on the surface level of your problems to truly begin to face your problems. So I tell yep. people when you stop drinking it doesn't solve all your problems but it finally gives you the emotional fortitude and the ability to begin to solve your problems and it becomes the beginning and i like to call myself a wellness advocate because it becomes the beginning of your wellness journey and like for me it was all right i stopped drinking initially and then from there i started and there's a there's a concept i call the inverted pyramid and you probably saw read it in the book and the inverted pyramid is just like you find that one thing that if you can if you can figure this out you can do kind of like James Clear talks about habit stacking and you can start fixing other things on top of it and so for me once i stopped doing alcohol all of a sudden i started saying all right how about my my sleep feels a little better i didn't recognize that the reason i wasn't sleeping was because of alcohol what are the other things i can do to sleep a little bit better boom now i started focusing hardcore on my sleep and and the, getting the room temperature the right amount magnesium when i go to bed and just don't drink caffeine after two o'clock. like all of these other things i would have never thought of before but now because i had alcohol out of the way now i can focus on sleep now when i look at my exercise and all of a sudden i'm getting a little tighter everything is starting to work better because i'm not having those bad cheeks days now i focus on how do i exercise better how do i be a little more focused on how to do the right sets and how to mix things up and blah and then so now i can focus on that now my diet i'm not having these bad pizza runs and tikka masala so now i'm saying all right what else can i do so it allows you to then start looking at all these different aspects of your life and because you don't have alcohol to hold you back 
then you're able to start dealing with it. Now, and there will be times that it's going to be hard, right? In the past, when you had an issue, maybe in, like you got in an argument at work, instead of dealing with the argument at work, you just went to the bar and drink your problems away. Now, because you don't have that drink to the, go to the bar and drink your problems away, you're going to have to sit and think about it a little bit and say, all right, what went wrong in that situation? What can I do to get it better? How do I improve this? And you're going to have to face some stuff. And it will be a little challenging at first, but the great part about it is over time, you will start building the ability to handle it without the alcohol. And that ability will belong to you. It won't be something that alcohol gave to you artificially. And that there makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. This whole conversation is about self-empowerment, right? And giving yourself the shot, right? Like giving yourself the shot. And, you know, and you kind of make the decision from there. I'm a strong believer that, you know, society, if you look at it as an entity, is generally pretty sober curious right now. And I think society is grappling with, you know, what role does alcohol actually need to play in our society? You know, so on a macro level, right? right? right. What do you think the aha moment is for society? at large to say, you know, we need to reevaluate our societal relationship with alcohol because it's a detriment to our kids. Yeah. It's a detriment to our, our, our output as a, you know, as a country. Uh, and it's killing people more than anything else, you know, so whether or not you have a, 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 uh, you know, stigmatic, you know, you know, alcoholic relationship, uh, you know, with, with the substance or not, you know, it clearly is not a good thing. It's yeah. it's fun. And for some people, it works until it doesn't. But I, I do think, similar to your point earlier, that we're going to have this moment that we at some point had in the conversation around cigarettes with alcohol. What do you think that aha moment is for us as a society? I'm not sure exactly what it is, Ray, to be honest with you. But where I think there needs to be more focus and truth telling told is in Hollywood. And what I mean by that is part of where we are socially engineered to think alcohol is something that we have to do and it's, and it's something that is positive in our lives and there's very little negative consequence from it is relation to movies and commercials, like in shows. You see it all the time. It is pervasive in everything we watch. And then when you see them talking about alcohol, I think that I um, there's a study, there was a, um, a research done that 90, it's like 94% of movies in some way has a character drinking alcohol at some point in the movie, right? Yeah. Most people don't drink alcohol, but the holly not most people, but a lot of people don't drink alcohol that much, that much, right? They always say about the concept of one to two drinks a day. And in our mind, that was before they, they talk about that one and two drinks a day aren't good for you. But they used to say that is enough to drink responsibly. That's that's safe, right? 60% of people drink less than one or two, one drink a week, which you want. If you drink one drink, if you drink two drinks a week, you're drinking more than 60% of people in the, the United States. Mm. Most people don't know that. They think that most people drink on it. And if you look at Hollywood, they make it seem like people drink that much. If you drink seven to eight drinks a, a week, you're drinking less than 70%. If you drink up to 15 drinks a week, you're drinking less, you're drinking more than 80%. And if you drink more than 15 drinks a week, you're drinking more than 90%. So one or two drinks a day, two drinks a day is 14 drinks a week. That's right. going to have you drinking more than 80% of the people. So most people don't drink that much but uh, or in the sense of the same level, but Hollywood would make it seem like they do. So yeah. that then creates the people that do drink, drink a lot because they think it's natural. And we all know that when you go out and drink, it's fun at the beginning. But towards the end, it's not that fun with what happens. If you look at how Hollywood portrays drinking, they rarely show the person being drunk and what it really does to affect them the negative in the, the, yeah, the next the day. Fallout. The fall. It seems you see Sherlock Holmes, he goes out and gets drunk. And then all of a sudden a, a, a case starts and he's he's the smartest guy in the room. That's not real life. That's not how it works, right? And I would think that when Hollywood starts to really portray drinking in the way that it is and and a little bit more than it is, I think then we will take a turn because right now they just they just make it seem like all is good in the hood and it's not good when you drink consistently in a bad way. So I don't know. We'll see. I hope it isn't anything bad or crazy that happens that really opens people's eyes open up. 
But I just hope that maybe over time it can stop being portrayed as as but now the way it is right now because it's definitely not yeah it it certainly um you know sends a a uh a confusing message to yeah. the, that 21 year old who's uh, you know supposed to drink responsibly uh you know but as a 21 year old there are so many things in life that you're trying to figure out how to do responsibly you know drinking is is you know not one that usually is at the forefront i mean i you know i sit here in you know in my my alcohol kind of with my alcohol free vision and you know watching a ball game or whatever the case may be there was there was a um i think it was a jim beam commercial that came on recently and the whole concept around it was like have more fun and be connected with people Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, it, but it was a Jim Beam commercial and I was sitting there saying like, man, they were really twisting, you know, the, the narrative around what this substance can do for someone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree with you on that. I'd love to be able to see that shift. I mean, there is a, and I don't know where that starts. I don't know if it starts with the power of, well, I think we've all seen that the actors don't have that much power, no. uh, you know, mm-hmm. but there are a handful of quite notable names that are you know living a sober life in their actual lives but then playing characters that aren't you know reflective of who they are on camp so i don't know where what, what needs to kind of shift in that space for them and i'm sure some of it is like dollars big dollars right like how much yeah. of these alcohol companies you know feeding into these movie studios and production studios and networks to be able to continue to perpetrate you know this concept that everybody's doing it um and having a great time at it uh, I think that needs to change, but I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. My money speaks, right? You got J Lo who doesn't drink, but she has her own liquor. Yeah. So and no, no knock on J Lo. She got to do what she got to do, you know, yeah. but you just got to separate re- real reality from the movies and the movies portray one thing. I just wish they would show reality a little bit more. Yeah, no, totally. Um, so, you know, as we kind of close out here, uh, I, I, I want to ask, you know, t- two things of you. One, for folks who are in a space, well, first, let me make this note. Regardless of when someone is listening to this episode, even if it doesn't happen to be in January, or maybe it's March or, you know, or June or July, you could start a 30, 60, yeah. 90 day challenge at any point in time. So let's just like call, <laughs> call that out. So for those folks who are looking at doing that, what resource would you point them to in order to get them that structure that they need in order to like get their hands around this? Yeah, so I just launched this, right? So I appreciate you asking. So dry90.com is the website I just created, which pretty much walks through everything I just shared with you for the Dry 90 Challenge. It walks through the reason for doing it. It walks you through um, tips and strategies around what you need to do exactly. It actually even gives you a um, sample calendar that you can then use so you can see how you can flex the two out of three, which shouldn't be too hard, as well as some different quit lit books you can use. So dry90.com give you everything there and there's a newsletter you can sign up for and if you do that i will then start sending you weekly tips on strategies of things that will keep you motivated and keep you aligned when things might get tough or just want to have different strategies to deal with various situations that you may come across so dry90.com check out the website i'm there join the newsletter We'd love to communicate with you. Uh, and then, of course, read the book, thebamboozlebook.com. is my website for the book, T-H-E, bamboozlebook.com. You can order a digital version off Amazon. You can order a physical version off Amazon or for me directly, or you can get a signed copy from me from that website as well, depending on what you want to do. So we we'll appreciate the support. But, um, but yo, those would be the two resources. Um, go check it out. And, um, yeah, the, uh, communicate with me because I would love to help anyone that's interested in giving a, taking the, uh, the challenge. No, I I love that, and thanks for 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 putting the work in, and and really creating these resources for folks, you know, who are you know, and I think I, to your point, I I think this is just a space that you know is glamorized in a lot of ways, and mm-hmm. and folks don't necessarily know what direction to turn to when they're trying to reinforce a healthier lifestyle. So I appreciate the fact that you're putting these resources together and putting them out there, um, you know, for folks to get their hands on. Um, you know, last question that I have is where can folks find you to follow you to ensure that they're, you know, getting the message and, 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 and abreast of the work that you're going to continue to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on all platforms, Ken and Middleton, that is it. You can find me K- K-E-N-M for McKimsey, my middle name, and then Middleton on all platforms. LinkedIn, Ken and Middleton or Ken McKimsey Middleton, you can find me there. 
Instagram, Kenham Middleton. You can find me there. And then I do, well, actually, I just got a TikTok, brand new, brand right. new to the TikTok world, baby. So <laughs> put some dances on you. And I'm actually the Ken M. Middleton okay. on TikTok because the Ken M. Middleton was already taken. But T-H-E, Ken M. Middleton. Um, but yeah, hit me up, follow me. Um, definitely would love to speak to anyone. I'm I'm just, or you can always email me, Ken at Ken M. Middleton, as you can guess what my email address is. I will always respond to someone's email. If someone emails me, I will take the time to respond. If I could help someone with my message, I'm always willing to do it. So feel free to reach out if there's anything I can do for you. Appreciate it, man. Ken, uh, I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm so glad that we were able to find some time to get together and just talk about your work, where you're at, and how you're continuing to kind of contribute back into, you know, making this, this you know, this community a, a better place. So thank you, man. I know that we'll stay in contact. But, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I would advocate anyone who who has an opportunity to listen to this this episode, go check out the resources that, that we laid out. We'll throw everything into the show notes. Um, you know, for folks to have for quick reference and, you know, and, and follow Ken, the dude is uh, full of inspiration and just love, love his message. So Ken, man, appreciate you. Right. Well, thank you, man. What you're doing with stacking days, man, is awesome, dude. So keep it up, man. Cause it is absolutely making a difference, man. So kudos to you, sir. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, that's it for, uh, for this episode. Uh, we'll see you next time. Be well, you know, one day at a time. Cool. I appreciate you guys listening to the Stacking Days podcast. I hope this episode added value to your recovery and wellness journey. Before we go our separate ways, let's connect on social. You can find us on TikTok and Instagram at Stacking Days or via the website www.stackingdays.com. By supporting the show, you can play a direct role in amplifying people of color in their pursuit of recovery. The easiest way to do that is to subscribe or hit the follow button. This way, you'll never miss an episode, all while playing an active part in creating the ecosystem where diverse voices and healing matter. This show is for the purpose of education and connection and is not a replacement for therapy or recovery care. For more information on the resources and support available, take a look at SAMHSA and some other resources shared in the description. Until we meet again, be well, one day at a time.